Welcome to Math 161. Today I'm going to be going through section 1.1, which is functions and function notation. Um, if you hear anything in the background, that's very likely uh, either my cat, my dog, or my wife, or my son, who can tell. So uh, today what we're going to end up doing <coughs> is effectively determining whether or not a relation is a function, evaluating a function, and determining if a function is one to one. And we're going to be doing that with a formula slash equation, a table, and a graph. Then we're gonna end with recognizing the toolkit functions. Toolkit functions, it's quite literally just memorization and recognition. So don't think of that as nearly as um, rigorous as our um, objectives one through three. So we're gonna start with how we define a function. So the textbook defines a function as a rule for a relationship between an input, um, we call that our independent quantity, and an output, our dependent quantity, such that each singular input can yield at most one output. And I really wanna emphasize this at, at most one, okay? Um, it effectively means that we can have no output. There's nothing wrong with that. That just means that the independent quantity that we looked at wasn't in the domain of the function. Uh, but we cannot have two outputs or three outputs or anything more than one. So the question we should be asking ourselves when we are thinking, is something a function? What we should be asking ourselves is, uh, does one input give at most one output? So we can express functions in three different ways. An equation or formula, a table or collection of ordered pairs, or a graph. So a one-to-one -one function is where every output has exactly one input mapped to it. So this is where we're focusing on our dependent values, our y-axis, and we wanna know um, whether or not it's got one matching input value to it. So when I'm asking the question, is something one-to-one, -one, what we should be asking is, does each output come from a unique input? There can be some serious confusion between these, um, but we're gonna talk about these subtleties with a function diagram. I think these are really useful ways to express functions. You won't see these a lot throughout the course. It's just gonna be a really helpful tool to recognize them today. So we've got our domain and our range. Our domain is our input values. The range is our output values. And so if I have the domain of three and the range of four, and I create some mapping between these, call it F, f of three is equal to four. That means when I put three into this function, I end up getting four as an output. Well, this relation, because we don't know if it's a function yet or not. And then we'll take negative five and we'll send it to nine. So is this a function? Take a second and answer this question. Yes, each input has exactly one output. So all is well with the kingdom there. And it's not even necessarily exactly, it's that we have uh, at most one. So think of it like each object in blue has only one target in green. Is this relation one-to-one? -one? Each output has a unique input, so yeah. So each object in green gets targeted only once. Now let's change it up a little bit. Let's say f of three is equal to four, f of three is equal to nine, and f of negative five is equal to one. We're gonna answer our two standard questions here. Is this a function? Take a second and answer that. The input of three has two outputs, so no. Okay, three has two targets that it sends, it, uh, that it maps to. Is this relation one to one? Each output has a unique input, so yes. So this is not a function, or I'm sorry, this is not one to one. Uh, no, hold on, it is one to one, but it's not a function. Now the textbook would say that this is not a one-to-one -one function, which is true. <clears throat> While the relation is one-to-one, -one, it's not a function. So ultimately what we're trying to say is that we're describing this thing in terms of whether or not it's a function. So it's not a function. So there's no way it could be a one-to-one -one function. Now we'll set it up a little differently. So we'll say uh, three and negative five both go to nine. This absolutely is a function. Now, is it one-to-one? -one? No, it is not one-to-one, -one. okay? Nine is targeted twice. So we've got a farmer, and let's go ahead and set up a formula for his wheat and soybean. Go ahead and take a second and do this. Pause the video, and I will talk about that formula. All right, so 
we have this relationship here. We have $10,000 of profit and we're selling wheat and soybean. Soybeans are $200 an acre. So for every acre of soybean, I get $200 from it. And I'm gonna add that to the uh, $700 per acre of wheat. So I get this equation here. Now, the problem we rub up against is this thing's not a, not a function because there's two variables represented as input. So what we wanna do is write a relation to determine the amount of wheat grown given the amount of soybean with the farmer's $10,000 profit over the season. So what we're gonna do here is set our input variable to be the acres of soybean. We call that variable S. And the output variable is gonna be the acres of wheat. So given, if you gave me the amount of soybean, I should be able to give you the amount of wheat, um, given that we're supposed to have a $10,000 profit. So what we're gonna do is move our soybean over to the other side of this equation, which is a little counterintuitive, but the given variable is supposed to be S. So we're gonna isolate W and we divide both sides by 700 and we get this um, basic kind of formula. Now we're gonna do some simplification here and we do the division of 10,000 by 700 because it's uh, dividing by a monomial, that means one term. And then the 200 divided by 700 Okay, so then we get 100 sevenths minus 2 sevenths s. Now, is this relation a function? So the question we should be asking ourselves here is, when wouldn't it be a function? Well, it wouldn't be a function if I had two outputs for one given input. So if you gave me an amount of soybean, I could have two answers for wheat. So that's not possible. It's just not possible because if you give me some amount of soybean, there's only one value of wheat that I can take on that would actually give me this profit. So let's express this function f since we know it can be a function with proper notation. So our w is equal to 100 sevenths minus 2 sevenths s, but the problem is our w here. Our w doesn't really mean anything out of context. What we need to do is express this as a function. Our input variable is s, so we're going to rewrite this as f of s. Now I want to compute f of 3 plus f of 5. This is just going to require a little bit of uh, fraction manipulation, but it's not going to be difficult. The way I'm going to go about this is first I'm going to go ahead and compute f of 3. So everywhere I see an s in this function, I put a 3 in its place. So I end up with 100 sevenths minus 6 sevenths. You could think of 3 as 3 over 1 and multiplying across. That's fine. And so then I end up with 94 sevenths. So that's my f of three. Now I need f of five. So everywhere I see an s, I put a five in its place and I perform the same computation and I end up with 90 sevenths. So now I'm gonna just add these together and I end up with 184 over seven. <clears throat> now, good mathematical practice would be to check and see if we have um, a possible reduction, but I'll tell you right now, 184 over seven is not gonna reduce nicely. Now, is this function one-to-one? -one? So the real question we should be asking here is, when wouldn't it be? Well, it wouldn't be one-to-one -one if there were any two inputs that went to the same output. So is it possible to have two different soybean yields given the same need for a wheat yield? Certainly not. This function is absolutely one-to-one. -one. And we'll talk about that when we get to um, toolkit functions, but I want you to, what I would love for you to observe here is that this function here, is actually just gonna be a linear function. If I think about this from a linear equation standpoint, 100 sevenths, I don't even know what that number is, but it's gonna be like up here. Pardon my poor penmanship. And what's happening is this number here is gonna represent my slope. It's going down two over seven. Okay, this is absolutely gonna be one to one. And we'll see later when we start checking for graphs uh, that this is gonna be really easy to identify. So just keep this in your back pocket. So when is a relation not one-to-one? -one? So consider this function here. This is a quadratic parabola, and we'll get into factoring this, and we'll certainly be talking about these at length later on in the course. When f of x, that means my y value, is equal to four, well, I get two different possible inputs. If I put in negative three and one, I get four 
as an output for both of these. So what that tells me is that there's two different inputs that give me one output. This is problematic. This function is absolutely not one-to-one. -one. Oh wow, I put the circle there. So <clears throat> keep this in mind as we continue forward. So let's examine this table. Is this relation a function? Take a second and look at it. The question we should be asking ourselves is, does every in have at most one target and out? If I make a diagram for this, sometimes these can be a little helpful. Well, here I see it's totally a function. There's only one output per input. Now, let's consider that same relation and let's see if it's one to one. Just by looking at our function diagram, is this thing one to one? Ah, three. Three is problematic. We see that three has two values targeting it. In particular, negative one and two. Negative one and two. They both go to three. So no, this is not one to one. It's a function, but it's not one to one. So it's not a one to one function. So if we, if we uh, let in be x and out be k of x, we're going to compute two of two times k of zero minus k of two. Again, we start by computing k of zero. So the output for zero is one. So then I'm saying two times k of zero, that's equal to two. And now k of two, that's going to be equal to three. So now I've just found a saucy way to ask you what's two minus three, negative one. All right, I'm going to leave these examples, or no, I'm sorry, let's solve for where y is equal to three. So what inputs give me an output of three? So now I'm looking at k of x, and I want to know what the x values are with a y value of three. So there's negative one, that gives me one of them, and then x equals two. Make sure that you're saying x equals for these. Okay. All right, now we're going to go ahead and skip through these. I want you to take a look at those on your, at your own leisure. But let's suppose I had this relation here and I wanted to plot all of these points out on the xy plane. All right, so we plot all these out. What I really want to do here is see if there's something on this graph that gives away those questions that I was asking earlier. So we already know that this isn't a function because the in of two has two different outputs. Okay, so how could we make that inference just by looking at the graph? Well, the offending in is two and we get two different y values. So if I drew a vertical line at two, what would happen is I would hit two different points. Because I hit two different points, that means that given an input on the x-axis, I have two separate in outputs on the y-axis. This is what we call the vertical line test. If I drew a vertical line at x equals two, what I've done is I've hit the graph twice, or I've hit the relation twice. So that means that this thing is not gonna be a function. This is gonna be very valuable. So if I'm given something like this, and I wanna know, is this thing a function? Well, the way that I would check this is by doing a whole bunch of vertical line tests, truthfully, an infinite number of them. But I'm not gonna need to do that. Every time I draw these lines, I see that I'm only hitting the function once, each and every time. So it's not difficult to see here that this absolutely is gonna pass the vertical line test. This thing is absolutely a function. Is this thing a function? Well, <clears throat> no. I only need to draw one vertical line to prove that it's not a function. And I drew one that happened to hit twice. So this thing is absolutely failing the vertical line test. It only needs to fail it once, by the way. I mean, I'm sure that there's, there's definitely a line we could draw, say, here, where it passes. It would only hit it once, right here. But it doesn't matter. It fails anywhere else, OK? Now, if we plot all of these out on the xy plane, just like we did before, we're going to ask a different question, namely, is this relation one to one? So pardon the dots are a little off, which is kind of important. So how could we tell if this was one to one? Well, we draw our vertical line tests. We draw our vertical lines. We see that this thing's absolutely a function. That's great. Now I want to know if this thing's one to one. So what I'm doing with one to one 
is I'm looking at the output values and seeing how many input values map to it. So instead of drawing a horizontal, or I'm sorry, a vertical line, I'm gonna to wanna to draw a horizontal line. So if I drew my horizontal line at three, I get two different N values. I get two different X values, okay? This is what we call the horizontal line test. If a function passes the horizontal line test, then the relation is one to one. Similarly, if it fails, the relation isn't. Therefore, this relation here is not one to one, as we've seen before. Now let's consider this function again. We know it's a function, we've saw that before. Is this thing one to one? Take a second and see if you can draw a line of a horizontal nature that determines whether or not this thing's a function. Nope, definitely not one to one. Here I hit it twice. I could have drawn lines where I hit it three times, doesn't matter. Ultimately, it fails. So since this thing fails the horizontal line test, it's absolutely not one to one. <clears throat> now, let's take a look at this graph. Is this thing one to one? Yeah, it's gonna pass the horizontal line test. Doesn't matter where I draw it, it's absolutely one to one. Now, here's the rub. This is technically not a one-to-one -one function because it's not a function, because it fails the vertical line test. Okay. Now, let's suppose that we've got this graph here, and we will talk about these graphs much later in the course. This is an absolute value function. We want to prove that this is, in fact, a function. Well, take a second and do that. So we perform the vertical line test and we see that no matter where we draw these vertical lines, we're only hitting this thing once, okay? Now we don't have to do this many necessarily. We can typically run this with our eyeballs, but it's absolutely gonna pass the vertical line test. Now this isn't necessarily, this isn't a rigorous proof by any stretch of the imagination, but that's all the expectation is for the course. If I'm giving you a graph, you should be able to tell me whether or not it's a function. You don't even have to tell me where it's, offending the vertical line test or anything like that. I just want to know if it is or not. This absolutely is a function. Is this one-to-one? -one? Heavens no. We perform a horizontal line test, boom. We could even put it right here. Doesn't even matter at negative 1.5. Doesn't matter. It's gonna fail. We could draw all kinds of different uh, horizontal lines and it's gonna fail. Now let's evaluate f of two. Take a second and do that. You may need to mind the scaling. All right, we see here. I wanna know what the output associated with the input value of x equals two is. I'm gonna draw a vertical line in my mind at x equals two. And I see that I end up here at negative three. So f of two is negative three. Now let's find out where the y value is equal to one. Here we're doing a different procedure. I'm gonna be drawing a horizontal line at y equals one, and I wanna see where we intersect, there and there. So now what are the x values associated with those intersection points? Well, x equals zero and x equals four, okay? Now, We've talked about one-to-oneness and um, whether or not something's a function, and we analyze that with an equation, with a graph, and with tables. What we have now are these toolkit functions. We have nine toolkit functions that we'll be utilizing in the course. What we're gonna do is spend time going through particular toolkit functions with rigor. We're gonna be solving equations for these things. We're gonna be simplifying expressions. We're gonna be doing all kinds of stuff with a lot of these. But some of these, we only need to have them for transformational purposes, what we're gonna see in 1.5. But for right now, what I really would love is for you all to have what I like to call a note card memorization of these things, where when you see a graph of it, you can tell me its name and you can tell me what the equation looks like. If you see the equation, you can tell me what the graph of it looks like. Ultimately, what you need to remember is these sort of like base parent functions, which in high school, that was what we called the, the what we called this curriculum. Uh, we called them parent functions. And we're gonna be doing transformations to these things. So I'm gonna go through all nine of them just really quickly. So we've got the constant function. Um, so if I had like f of x equals two, it would just be a horizontal line at two. 
you see all the output values are two, no matter what the input is. Then we've got the identity function. This will come in handy when we talk about um, inverse functions in 1.6 and beyond. Uh, what we have here is whatever you give me as an input value, I, I copycat that exact value for the y. Absolute value function, we'll talk about this much later in the course. Um, what absolute value is, is where we take a number and we change it into its distance from zero. So if you think about negative two, how far is negative two from zero? Two units. Negative one is one unit away. Zero is zero away. One is one unit away. Two is two units away, et cetera. So that's why you're always going to see these things above the y axis, or x axis, by the way, because distance is never negative. Then we've got our reciprocal function. Effectively, what that means is you take the input value and you um, put it under one. Okay, you do its reciprocal. Okay. Now, obviously, we're going to have a problem at zero because you can't divide by zero. We will spend a lot of time talking about that in this course. Then the reciprocal squared function, we take the reciprocal of the function of the input value and then we square it. Okay. We've got the quadratic function. We're going to spend a lot of time talking about these in chapter three as they pertain to polynomials. We've got the cubic function, which we're going to address um, in polynomials as well. We've got the square root function, um, which there's an interesting relationship between the way this thing is shaped and the quadratic function, um, but we're going to talk about that in inverses. The cubic root function, again, not shockingly, it's we sort of are seeing a pattern between the cubic root function and the cubic function as it pertains to their shape. And again, that's going to be addressed in full um, in section 1.6, where we're talking about inverses. And that's it. This was your first online lesson for Math 161 this summer.